Video Lecture 3, Periodic Families. Whether you've left school or you're still at school, you can appreciate the sheer fun and mayhem that chemistry can be. There's so much to it. Bunsen burners, mixing chemicals. Very nice. Now, you may have been allowed to mix very small amounts of lithium with water. You may, if with a responsible adult, have mixed H2O with sodium. And you may, under very strict scientific control, have witnessed potassium mixed with water. But the odds are, if you have, it will only ever have been on one of those rubbish science videos. There you go, mate. Present. Oh, thank you very much. These next two are the dog's nuts of the periodic table. They are, if you like, the king and queen of alkali metals. Mix these babies with water, stand well back, and watch the mayhem. And that's just what we're going to do. Mr. Tickle, bring on the rubidium. Here it is. Is that it? Well, it might not look like much, Richard, but it's a highly reactive metal. It's sealed in this glass tube under argon atmosphere conditions, just for safety. Right, so what's going to happen when you drop that in the water? Well, imagine, if you will, letting off a hand grenade in a bathtub. Right, Righto, I'm off. Have that. OK. Good luck. <sighs> OK, Tickle. Drop the rubidium in the water. Stand back, everybody. This one's going to be bad. Uh, two grams of rubidium will only react when our specially designed vial dissolves in the water, which gives John a few crucial seconds to get into our safety zone. That is more like it. Only on Brainiac do you get that kind of science. But I believe we can go one better. There is one more alkali metal we can legally use. Yes, Richard. Cesium, the emperor of alkali metals, particularly nasty, could go off at any time. And that's it? Oh, yes. Brilliant. I like it already. Now, what's that going to do when it hits the water? Imagine a depth charge in a bathtub. Fair enough, mate. I'll leave you to it. Good luck. Thank you. OK, John. Go for it. Warning! 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 Extreme danger! Clear the area! As our cesium sinks in the water, the rapid generation of hydrogen gas should produce quite an explosion. And it does. Magnificent. And I think that concludes today's experiment. There is, I should say, one more, even more reactive metal, francium. But for some reason, they wouldn't let us have any of that. Still, there you go. Today's lesson, never mixed alkali metals with water. So, one of the first periodic families that we're going to look at are the alkali metals. These are in group 1A. And so... Remember, a group is a horizontal column, so if we look, this group is our alkali metals. Um, they tend to be the most reactive metals, and remember, metals are uh, shiny. They're soft, and like you saw in the video, they're extremely reactive with water. Now, they're not quite as reactive as they, as they showed in the video. That was, a little, that was a little bit of Hollywood magic, but they are very reactive. And one of the things that you noticed, if we looked, as we went down the periodic table from lithium to sodium, from sodium to potassium, potassium to rubidium, rubidium to cesium, they became more reactive as we went down. Uh, if we talk about the valence shell of our alkali metals, if we talk about the valence shell of our alkali metals, um, what do we notice? Well, remember that our valence shell is the outermost energy level, so here's energy level 1, energy level 2, energy level 3. We take a look in energy level 4, what do we notice? That there's one electron. When we take a look at sodium, energy level 3, the outermost electron, there's only one. We can see this if we did an electron configuration too. Uh, if we look at lithium, 1s2, 
2s1, one valence electron. Sodium with 11, we see that. Potassium with 19, we see one electron. We see one electron there. Um, if we do the noble gas configuration for rubidium, uh, it would be krypton 5s1. So take a look. It's this one valence electron that makes our alkali metals very reactive. Group 2A, beryllium, magnesium, calcium, barium, and radium. These are all our alkaline earth metals. And this is our group here. This is group 2A. So our alkaline earth metals have uh, some slightly different properties. They are higher density and higher melting points than the alkali metals. They're not as reactive as the alkali metals. Uh, if we take a look at magnesium, one of the things to notice is if we look at the valence shell, there's one, two valence electrons. Uh, if we take a look at magnesium, the uh, we see two of them. If we take a look at beryllium with four electrons, our electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2. Highest energy level, two electrons. What do you think you could predict about calcium? That's right, calcium would have two valence electrons. AR, 3s2. So one of our properties of our alkaline earth metals is that they have two valence electrons. Now if we go to the transition metals, the D block, so this portion here, okay, we get to our transition elements. Okay? Notice these are not, we're not saying 2A, we're not saying 1A. Our A block elements, our A block elements are our representative groups. And a representative group means that when we look at the first element in each of the groups, that it basically represents what we're going to see below it. So all of these elements are going to have very similar chemical properties. Not so much for our transition metals. Okay? Not very much for our transition elements. These aren't very, these aren't very reactive at all. Um, therefore, the majority of these guys are going to exist as, since they're not very reactive, uh, the majority of these guys are going to exist in their elemental form. So if we take a look at some of these, and we take a look at some of these, things like chromium. Okay, chromium is used in jewelry because it's shiny. Copper. Not very abundant, but very useful, because remember, copper is used in wires. Copper is also used in, um, in making coins. Silver and gold. Not very reactive. Don't form many compounds. Doesn't say that they won't, but they don't form many. Our inner transition metals, the F block, uh, usually occur together and are very, very difficult to separate. Um, in general, they have about, they usually lose three valence electrons and uh, are of little commercial importance. One of the main inner transition metals that, uh, that we would care about is element number 92, which is uranium. Uranium is a radioactive element that's often used in nuclear power plants. Our P block, including the boron family, carbon family, nitrogen family, oxygen family, halogens, and noble gases. So this is our P block. So again, we're back to representative elements along with those elements that are in the S block. So our first family is the boron family. It's, and boron is actually the only semi-metal in the whole family. Uh, aluminum and below are metals. And aluminum tends to be the most important, one of the more important elements in, uh, in the family. 
the boron family will have three valence electrons. And if we take a look, uh, if we consider boron's electron configuration, 1s2, 2s2, 2p1, well, energy level 2 is the outermost energy level, therefore, it, and there are three total electrons. So, uh, boron family is going to have three valence. Our next p-block family is group 4a, the carbon group. It includes silicon and germanium, which are semi-metals, but it also includes tin and lead, which are metals. One of the things to take a look at, one of the things to notice is that this family is going to have four valence electrons. Uh, if we take carbon, who the family is named for, electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. Again, 2 being the outermost energy level, there are the four valence electrons. If we step down, if we step down from carbon into silicon, uh, silicon. If we go to the next element below carbon, which is silicon, silicon is going to have 14 total electrons. So the electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p2. So in this case, 3 is the outermost, and we see four valence electrons there. Our next family is the nitrogen family, the nitrogen group. 80% uh, of the atmosphere is nitrogen. It's, it's not very reactive, and oftentimes nitrogen is going to be used in, fertil in fertilizers. Uh, nitrogen, having seven, valence, or having seven electrons, with the electron configuration 1s2, 2s2, 2p3, there's seven electrons, two being the outermost energy level. Our carbon group has a total of five valence electrons. Uh, so if you haven't noticed at this point, if you take a look, our group is 5A, and it has five valence electrons. Did you notice anything about group 3, 4, 1, or 2A? They would have had the same number of valence electrons there as well. Um, oxygen family, oxygen is the most abundant element on Earth. Uh, it does combine together sometimes to make O3, which is ozone. And uh, it's a good thing that that ozone layer is around the Earth, high in the atmosphere, because ozone is actually poisonous at low levels. If you had to take a guess on how many valence electrons group 6 had, hopefully you said 6. If we take a look at sulfur, if we take a look at sulfur, uh, 16 electrons, so 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p4. There's the outermost energy level with 6 valence electrons. Oxygen, 1s2, 2s2, 2p4, again, 6 valence electrons. So up until this point, up until this point, the only actual family names you needed to know were group 1A, which were the alkali metals, group 2A, which are the alkaline earth metals. Well, you're also going to now need to know 7A, which is the halogen family. The halogen family made of fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. These are the salt formers, which means when they form compounds, they're often going to form salts. And usually what's going to happen when they come together, it's going to be a metal plus a halogen to form that salt. Your example is sodium chloride. Remember, chlorine is a poisonous gas, so if you were to breathe in chlorine, you'd die. But if you mix it together with some sodium molecules, you're going to get what we know as table salt, which the only way you're going to die from table salt is if you have a little bit too much of it. Um, these uh, halogens are going to have seven valence electrons. Again, if we take a look, uh, let's go ahead and pick bromine. Uh, bromine having 35 electrons total. We'll do the noble gas configuration, which is AR. 
Argon's at the end of energy level 3, so it's 4s2, 3d10, 4p. Now, again, we're going to look at the outermost energy level. So it's 4, the 4s and the 4p. Just because the 3d is in the middle of it, 4 is still the highest or outermost energy level. So this is where we get our 7 valence electrons. Our last group is the noble gases. This is group 8A. This is group 8A. Uh, helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, and radon. These are the least reactive and most stable of all elements. Most stable because it has a full octet. Okay. Uh, the most abundant noble gas happens to be argon. Uh, the one thing that you've got to be careful about here is we would most of the time assume eight valence electrons. Hence octet, ready, eight. There's only one exception, and that's helium. Okay, Helium only has two valence electrons, while well, the rest of the noble gases have eight. Well, why does helium have two valence electrons but still considered stable? Well, if you notice, on the periodic table, if we look at the periodic table, look on the periodic table, helium is in group, or sorry, is in period one, meaning that it has one energy level. Well, if it only has one energy level, the first energy level holds two electrons max. If you remember, that's where we, we were using that 2n squared from last chapter. When we look at helium's electron configuration, helium's electron configuration is 1s2. We can't put any more electrons in the first energy level. If we had one more electron, it would be in 2s1. So that means that helium has a full valence shell with only two electrons. That kind of that thought kind of goes along to here. Hydrogen. We didn't put hydrogen in any family. Hydrogen can't be an alkali metal because it's not a metal. But it's above the alkali metals because it, like the alkali metals, have one valence electron. Uh, hydrogen happens to be the most abundant element in the universe. It's light enough to even escape the pull of gravity. But now if we think about, now let's talk about this, right? Hydrogen, why is it, with one valence electron, it's special. Hydrogen can gain electrons or lose electrons. It can also share electrons. And when hydrogen is going to want to do all of this stuff, okay, again, if you remember looking at the periodic table, Hydrogen's right here. Again, only one energy level. So we can only fit a second electron here. So if it wants to gain or share, it's only going to gain or share one more electron. If it loses, if it loses this electron, if it, this goes away, and it's just this positive, okay, it's just a positive one positive proton left in the nucleus, that's all it is. It's a proton. Okay, it's a hydrogen atom that it lost one of its electrons. That whole concept of protons is going to become, is going to, you're going to see that again a little bit more next year once you guys get into biology. Um, but just kind of remember there, uh, hydrogen is only going to want to gain one electron to have a full valence shell.